Um, welcome, everybody. We're just waiting uh, for our attendees to uh, fill up. So we'll start in a, in a minute or two. For those of you just tuning in, we're just waiting a little bit for everybody to join. Just wait one, one or two more minutes and then we'll get going. Oh, we're we're um, we're filling up. We have uh, about a hundred people. We're just uh, waiting a little bit longer. I'm going to start in a minute or two. I get it in. You could start now. All right, I'm going to get started. I, I know more people will be um, will coming on as we get going. Welcome everyone to this Haystack Book Festival event. Thank you so much to David Sibley for joining us this afternoon. And thank you to the Norfolk Foundation and to the Norfolk Library for making all of this possible. Um, we uh, just want to remind everybody to stay muted. Um, if you have a question for uh, David Sibley, please post it in the Q&A and I will field questions uh, at the end of the talk. Um, we are so pleased to have David here with us today. He's, um, you know, all of us who are interested in birds probably have many, many, um, uh, bird guides to hand, but I think that many of us who are part of this conversation or this talk have a very well-thumbed uh, <laughs> edition of the Sibley Guide. It's certainly my first, um, my first go-to. Uh, the book first came out in the year 2000, and uh, my figures are old. As of 2015, it had already sold 750,000 copies, and I know uh, it's it's very uh, widely loved and and much used. So David uh, Sibley began his birding life very young, at the age of eight, I believe, uh, going out and looking and watching and taking notes and and really teaching himself to be the amazing ornithologist that he's become. And in addition to that, teaching himself how to be a, an artist as well, so that he's done all the illustrations and paintings of his books. And um, the, the um, theme of, one of the themes of this Haystack Book Festival has been about creativity and, and solitude. And certainly, as David pointed out earlier to me, you know, all authors really um, 
solitude is a big part of their life. You can't get your work done unless you get yourself in a room in front of your piece of paper. But I think um, it's particularly true of what David has done in his life with uh, both observation, spending hours, 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 hours out looking at the world, looking at birds in the world and how they behave and how they manage to live their lives and then coming back and sitting in front of that piece of paper or that um, computer and, and getting it all down the way he does. And I think, um, uh, you know, making, making a life out of your creativity is one of the ways you know you've made, you've made the right choices. And certainly um, David Sibley has done that in spades. His late, the book he's going to talk about today, uh, about how to be a bird, um, is, is full of wonderful information, wonderful illustrations, as I'm sure many of you have seen already. And I think we're so lucky to have you here and um, we're very much looking forward to hear what you have to say. So over to you, David. All right, well, thank you. Thanks, it's great to be with you. And uh, thanks to everybody for coming out today. Um, so I would um, just to, Add to what Susanna was just saying. I, I am. I mean, I can say that I am. I'm self-taught, but I. I should uh, confess that my father's an ornithologist, so I grew up in, <laughs> in an academic bird science family, and had access and and all kinds of mentoring from him and from graduate students and other ornithologists, other bird watchers. And I think that while I've I've certainly spent a lot of time on my own out in the field, and and that's primarily what what I do for my my artwork and my my bird study. But I've still uh, learned a tremendous amount um, from other people, from books. I I have to give a a big a big shout out, a lot of credit to everyone else who has studied birds, published um, research. Um, wondered about birds and asked questions. Um, my conversations with other birders are often a great source of just ideas and questions. What are what what are birds doing and why? <laughs> People ask the most interesting questions, um, and following up on that is often how I learn some of the most uh, most interesting remarkable things about birds is just trying to answer all of the questions that I hear. And that's, that actually <laughs> leads into my latest book, What It's Like to Be a Bird. That The idea for this book started out as um, a, an idea for a children's book. I wanted to produce a bird book for children, but I wanted it to be more than just a simplified field guide. I wanted it to explain some of the remarkable things about birds, what they're doing and why. And as I did that research, the book kind of evolved into much more of that, just uh, aren't birds amazing? And uh, it still retains some aspects of a children's book, but, but one of my goals in the book was to answer a lot of the most common questions that I hear from from birders and non-birders, my neighbors, friends, just you know, people who see me and say, hey, I, I was wondering about this, about birds. So I'm gonna share my screen and do a, show a little slideshow. Um, so hopefully you're now seeing a blue jay on the screen. So this book, it's, it's a, was a much more artistic sort of illustration endeavor than a field guide. I could be a lot more creative with the artwork. And as I was saying that trying to answer questions, common questions about birds or just questions that I dreamed up um, led me into all kinds of things like this. This illustration is answering the question, is a roadrunner really that much faster than a coyote as in the old cartoons? <laughs> And uh, this, this is a graphic uh, explanation of the, the answer. No, a coyote is actually much faster than a roadrunner. A roadrunner is about as fast as Usain Bolt, so faster than most humans. Um, 
But in this hypothetical race, the ostrich would win, coyote not far behind, and the roadrunner leading the pack of humans. Um, but I had a lot of fun just thinking up these questions and then just browsing through the scientific literature, pulling together lots of different bits of information. And, um, and I learned a tremendous amount on every single thing I researched. I learned a lot about birds. Um, and it was really a great, uh, a great experience for me putting this book together. So birds are the direct descendants of dinosaurs. This dinosaur had feathers. It lived about 160, 160 million years ago. Um, called Anchiornis. And this fossil was so well preserved that the researchers, researchers were able to look at it under an electron microscope and they could actually see the imprint of the pigment granules in the fossil so they could reconstruct the color patterns of the feathers. Um, they could see the shapes of the feathers and also which parts were black, which parts were gray, the, the long feathers on the crest a sort of reddish brown, a different kind of melanin. Um, and so this is my own uh, reconstruction of what that dinosaur might have looked like with these loose shaggy feathers and uh, a color pattern of gray, black, white, and rust. Um, and these dinosaurs, like all the dinosaurs, they were wiped out by an asteroid that hit in what is now the Yucatan about 65 million years ago. Um, that asteroid impact was so catastrophic, it wiped out at least 75% of all the species, uh, all the diversity of life on Earth. Um, it's thought that only three species of birds survived the asteroid impact. There were lots of birds and bird dinosaur sort of links uh, living when the asteroid struck. Um, only three species of small ground-dwelling birds survived the asteroid impact 65 million years ago and have evolved since then into all of the 10,000 plus species that we see today. Um, and so feathers, as we know now from fossils, feathers first appeared on dinosaurs more than 160 million years ago, long before birds. Um, and the evolution of feathers is uh, thought to have followed a path like these five stages here, beginning on the far left with just a hollow bristle, um, a simple straight um, bristle that uh, it would have been helpful for insulation, maybe protection against abrasion or um, uh, scratches, maybe uh, could also have been colored for camouflage or for display. Um, the next stage is the, the fibers that make up the bristles separate into individual strands and form a sort of fuzz like down. And that would have been even better for insulation, might have offered even some water repellency and again, coloration. Um, the next stage is a, a branching pattern develops with a, a central shaft and lots of loose strands coming off of that central shaft. And the next stage, like which is really the modern feather, um, another level of branching develops so that there's a central shaft, the barbs, the fibers coming off of the side of the central shaft. And then each barb has multiple small branches coming off of it that are the barbules that hook, sort of hook and loop together to hold each of the barbs together with its neighbor. So once the barbs are locked together in that way, the feather, the whole feather forms a much more solid flat surface. And that is, makes things like flight possible. Um, that feather in the center, the loose sort of shaggy uh, structure is like a modern ostrich plume. And you know, if you've if you've had one of those feathers and waved it around in the air, there's not much resistance to the air. It just sort of flops around. It wouldn't be much use for flight because it wouldn't capture any air, wouldn't press against the air. So that, that Anchiornis probably couldn't fly, 
probably couldn't even really glide with those feathers. But this next stage with the barbs locking together really made flight possible. And the final stage on the far right is these super specialized feathers that modern birds have. Um, this is one of the long flight feathers um, from something like a robin. Um, it's uh, asymmetrical. The leading edge is narrower than the trailing edge. The, the barbs on the leading edge come out at a different angle. The tip is shaped differently, uh, narrower than the rest of the feather. And they're, they're uh, just incredibly specialized. So based on that path of evolution, we can infer that flight is a recent development, that feathers evolved first just for coloration, insulation, maybe some other advantages, but flight is a very recent development and requires extremely specialized feathers. Um, this is a, a house sparrow, a common bird, but I've uh, just outlined all of the feathers and you can see how each, the whole bird is covered by feathers and they're, they're arranged in a very organized way and each feather um, specially shaped and sized for its particular location on the bird. Um, here's another example of that, the head of a common raven with feathers um, representing different points on the, on the bird's head. So up here above the bill, these bristles, feathers that are really just um, a single shaft, just a long bristle um, to cover the nostrils. Um, and then as you go back over the top of the head, very tiny feathers on the forehead, getting larger to the back of the head. Um, below the bill here, this feather from the throat is specialized for coloration. So it's long and pointed with um, iridescent margins. And then this feather behind the head here is one of the feathers that would go over the ear right here, covering the ear. And these feathers are, even more specialized. They're um, stiff, but have uh, widely spaced barbs. So a bunch of these feathers laying together across the ear opening would still um, not completely block the ear opening. They'd form just a, a lattice, sort of a net that would protect the ear from um, things that might bump against the side of the head, but still allow sound to pass through. And um, that's another, well, they also streamline, it's very important for the side of the head to be streamlined there. These birds, birds, all birds travel at a normal sort of flying speed of 25 miles an hour or so. Many birds go much faster. And at 25 miles per hour, if you're riding a bike at that speed, it's hard to hear anything. The wind in your ears, the turbulence is so noisy. And birds are traveling at that speed all the time, but their, the streamlined covering over their ears probably makes it virtually silent so that they can still hear perfectly well, even though they're traveling at such high speed. Um, this is going back to that, that specialized long flight feather of a bird and, and even the shape of the shaft of the feather changes along its length. So the feather, the, the base of the feather, the whole shaft is a, a foam filled tube, which is a, the, the strongest, the best balance of light weight and strength that is known. And it's like really high tech um, tubing now is made in a similar way to how feathers are formed with the foam in the middle to provide some, some structure, layers of material around the outside with fibers oriented in different directions. And then as the shape of that tube changes along the length of the feather, it gives it different properties of flexibility and stiffness. So at each point along its length, the feather is going to bend more or less easily or bend in a, slight, in a different direction more easily. And that has evolved to, um, to make flight as, as efficient as it can possibly be. Um, and well, I'm sure it continues to evolve to make flight more efficient. Um, and another thing about feathers, this was one of, the, one of the many, many things that surprised me as I was working on this book. I had never 
realize that birds spend a lot of time preening and as they preen they're reaching back to a gland at the base of their tail where they get oil on their bill and they rub that oil across their feathers and I had always assumed that it was the oil that made the feathers waterproof so that the way water rolls off a duck's back um, was just logical to assume that that was because of the oil that the birds were preening onto their feathers, but it turns out feathers are waterproof because of their structure. It's the spacing of the barbs and maybe other features of the, the structure of the surface of the feather that makes water just bead up and roll off. Um, the oil probably helps to keep water from sticking, but it's primarily the structure of the feather. So these feathers are, they're not only good for uh, insulation, streamlining, um, coloration, they're also waterproof, all because of the microscopic structure. Now feathers wear out. They're, once a feather grows, it's like our hair. It's, it's a dead structure, so it, it just wears out through bleaching and wear and tear. And most birds molt and replace their feathers once a year. So a feather has to last for a full year, and then it's, a new one grows to replace it. And this feather is a tail feather from a red-winged blackbird. Um, it would be a, a few inches long. Um, and in this illustration, I've painted these very subtle dark and light bands across the feather. And I learned that those bands, they're like growth rings in a tree. They represent a day and night cycle of growth. And I can't remember right now whether the dark is daytime or nighttime, but, but each, each pair of, each dark light pair of bands represents a 24 hour period of feather growth. And the feather grows just a few millimeters a day, like a, less than a quarter of an inch. So a feather like this from a red winged blackbird might take about three weeks to grow the full length of the feather. A little tiny body feather from, uh, from the same bird might only take a, a day. Um, but all birds' feathers grow at about the same rate. Um, bigger birds don't grow their feathers faster. They just grow bigger feathers at, at the same rate. So a bird like an eagle or a pelican with feathers a foot long, those feathers could take three months to grow one feather. And those birds, um, uh, molt less often because they can't afford to uh, have all of their feathers growing. It's, it takes a lot of resources and it, it, it compromises the bird's ability to fly and other things. So they'll uh, have a three-year cycle of molt where some of the feathers on, on eagles, pelicans, other large birds like that will um, have to last a full three years before they're replaced. Um, this is a chimney swift, which is a completely aerial bird. They, they essentially live in the sky. And um, uh, so flight, even more than most birds, flight is critical to a chimney swift. So how do they molt their wing feathers and keep flying? And the answer is this um, timeline. So most birds, um, molt their wing feathers gradually. Um, so they're only, they're only missing one or two feathers at a time and growing new ones as replacements. They begin on the inner part of the wing and the molt gradually progresses to the outer part of the wing over a period of maybe two months. So this chimney swift is shown here over the, over the whole two month period as it grows new feathers. At each point, it's only missing one, one or two feathers. New feathers are growing in their place. It's got a small gap in the wings, but still the, the neighboring feathers overlap and the bird can still fly quite well. And they do this at a time of year, like late summer in this case, where there's, the weather's good, there's lots of food, um, so they can, they can still get by. Um, birds generally don't molt uh, during a time of the year when they have other stresses, like during migration or in the winter when food might be scarce or when they're nesting and they have to be providing extra food for the young. 
those are times when they're devoted to those other things. And, and molt happens usually after the young have fledged. So the adult birds are, they're empty nesters, literally. <laughs> and there's lots of food, it's late summer, the weather's nice, and they're not migrating yet. So it's a good chance to uh, take, a, take six weeks or eight weeks and uh, grow new feathers. Um, now, another thing that makes flight possible is a, a very um, highly evolved skeleton. And you've probably heard that birds' bones are extremely lightweight, um, hollow tubes. And they are, but actually, if you, uh, one researcher compared the weight of a bird's skeleton to the weight of the skeleton of a mammal of similar size, and they're about the same. So a bird's skeleton is the same percentage of body weight as, say, a mouse skeleton. Um, but what birds have is um, hollow bones, so that gives them added uh, strength and stiffness with um, less weight, and their bone tissue is denser, uh, which also makes it stronger and stiffer than the bones of a, of a mammal. Um, so birds, they can have these very long slender bones to allow them to have um, long wings, long legs, um, and the added weight of the denser bone tissue is made up for by the, the hollow, uh, these hollow tubes and by um, uh, sort of consolidating the skeleton so that a bunch of where we have many different bones, like in the pelvis or um, the uh, wrists and hands, things like that, birds have fused all those bones together into uh, a much simpler skeleton so that there's less uh, weight there. So they don't have a super, they don't uh, actually have a super lightweight skeleton, but it's, um, uh, they have, bones that are very strong and stiff and long and slender um, without any added weight. Um, so as birds evolved from dinosaurs, apparently one of the adaptations that really opened the door to flight and to the structure of a bird's wing is the ability to fold the wrist joint and the elbow joint beyond 90 degrees. Um, so most, uh, uh, animals, our, our wrist joint doesn't bend more than 90 degrees, and for a bird's wing to fold up against the side of its body and to move in all the ways it needs to move during flight, flapping flight, um, that, uh, that joint had to get some extra mobility. So this is the way the, the wing of a black-throated blue warbler goes from folded up tightly against the side of the body on the left to fully spread and ready for flight on the right. And the huge range of different flight styles and um, wing shapes that we see in birds um, has all evolved to, to suit their particular lifestyle and their needs. Um, but it mostly has to do with the, the lengths of feathers and the length of the wing bones. So this is a comparison of a ring-billed gull on the left and a chimney swift on the right. Um, two birds that, that are both very good at flying, spend a lot of time in the air, but have very different flight styles. Um, and uh, the gull on the left has much longer arm bones, the, the bones shown in blue here, close to the body. Um, and uh, on the gull, it's got long arms, um, which gives it those long sort of crooked wings. And the chimney swift has extremely short arm bones and uh, long hand bones uh, and a much, uh, that much different flight style uh, with its flickering wing beats. So uh, we've talked about feathers and, and the skeleton being important for flight, but another adaptation that doesn't get a lot of attention that but that is critical for allowing birds to fly is the balance of weight. Um, so this is a pheasant showing the, 
the body in, in reddish and the feathers in gray. Um, so the feathers, uh, the wings are almost entirely feathers. The tail is entirely feathers. Um, and all of the mass of muscle and bone is uh, concentrated in one, one compact um, uh, body, this, the center of the body or the center of mass is right um, balanced underneath the wings. And um, it makes flight uh, possible and efficient. Um, and it's one reason that birds don't have teeth, um, that uh, the way you see how the head is stretched out in front of the body here as the bird flies, if this pheasant had teeth, which are quite heavy, um, it would be uh, off balance. The head would be too heavy. Um, and so birds instead um, have a lightweight bill, just really just for handling food, for picking up food and then swallowing it. So a bird like a pheasant just swallows seeds whole. And those seeds in the bird's stomach then, which is now balanced underneath the wings in the center of the body, inside the stomach then, the seeds are ground up by sand and uh, grit that the birds swallow. And it's that sand and grit that essentially performs the role of teeth where the stomach muscles squeeze and, and press and grind that sand and grit together with the seeds to uh, essentially chew the food inside the stomach. But again, it's all happening in a balanced position in the center of the body. So a pheasant can find a good food source, quickly swallow a whole bunch of food, and then easily take off and fly just a few seconds later um, and still uh, well balanced in flight. Um, the surf scoter is an example of a bird that is uh, uh, surf scoters actually eat, they eat clams, shellfish, crabs, other things like that, and they swallow them whole. They swallow a whole clam and their stomach muscles are strong enough to crush the clam inside their body. So again, they're, they're diving down under the water, finding a clam or a mussel, um, prying it loose from wherever it is. They come to the surface and swallow it immediately, and which is all a good idea also because there are always gulls and other sort of uh, uh, predatory kleptoparasite birds that want to steal the food that the scoters are bringing up from the bottom of the ocean. So the scoter comes to the surface with a clam and before the gull can get there and steal it, the scoter swallows it, it gulps it down. And then over a period of uh, probably minutes, the, the clam gets crushed in the scoter's stomach. And, uh, and they don't need to swallow grit or sand because the fragments of clam shells act as, as the grit that helps to grind up their food. Um, and another adaptation that allows flight is um, the bird's respiratory system. And this was something that I had always heard about it, but never really understood it until I had to um, describe it and illustrate it for this book. So this, it's a, a songbird, a, a bunting on the left, showing the, the position of air sacs in the body. So birds have, they have lungs, but very different from ours, and air sacs. And the air sacs take up a large percentage of their, their body volume. Um, the air sacs are shown in blue and the lungs in darker purplish color. So the lungs are in the center of the back of this bird. They're small. And a bird's lungs don't expand and contract like ours. They're, they're fixed and rigid. They're like a car radiator. The air flows through um, just as a, as a constant flow passing through, but the, the flow of air is controlled by the air sacs. It's the air sacs that expand and contract, but they're just reservoirs that, that hold air and then feed it through the lungs. 
So because the bird's lungs are not expanding and contracting like ours, they can have the, the membranes for gas exchange can be thinner, can be arranged in a way that makes for more efficient transfer of gases. Um, and because of the way the air sacs work, um, air is always passing through the bird's lungs in the same direction on inhale and exhale. Uh, they're getting fresh air flowing through their lungs. So a bird is getting a constant supply of fresh air, fresh oxygen. And unlike us, we have to breathe in, get a bunch of oxygen. And then before we can, as we use up that oxygen, to get fresh oxygen, we have to breathe out and then breathe in more fresh air. The bird is, uh, because of the air sac system, when they breathe in, they pull fresh air in through the lungs and fill up the air sac, the rear air sac on the left here, that fills up with fresh air when they inhale. When they exhale, the fresh air that has filled up the rear air sac gets forced forward through the lungs, so they get more fresh air. They have a, just a constant flow of fresh air. Um, and this explains how Partly how birds like bobolinks and other species can sing so elaborately in flight. So they're flying, flapping up in the air and singing at the same time. It's safe to say that you have never seen a bird that's out of breath. They simply don't get out of breath. They can go up to 10,000 feet or 20,000 feet altitude when they're migrating and uh, continue flying up there. Um, and it's thought that this, this respiratory system evolved in the dinosaurs at a time in the very distant past when the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere was only half of what it is now. So the dinosaurs needed a super efficient respiratory system. Um, this system evolved and birds are now the beneficiaries of it. So they can perform all these extraordinary feats of flight and endurance and altitude and um, uh, never uh, be out of breath. Uh, so uh, the incredible variety of birds um, nowadays taking, taking advantage of many different habitats, many different environments, different food sources, um, all have evolved different flight styles, different methods or sort of uh, manners of flight that that fit their lifestyle. So we have birds like the common loon that um, have relatively small wings and a quite heavy body. They have to run up along the water to get up enough airspeed before they can take off like a like a a, a, a jet airplane that uh, needs a long runway to just to get up enough speed before they can become airborne. And they actually fly at 50 or 60 miles per hour. That's the airspeed that they require, or that, that is normal for them, uh, flapping constantly. Um, this bird, like a winter wren, that only weighs maybe six grams, um, a fraction of an ounce, and uh, has relatively big wings. Flight is easy for them, but um, they, uh, they fly at relatively low speed and they flap almost constantly. Um, birds like house finch, many species of songbirds have this undulating flight style where they flap a little bit and gain, or they rise up and then close their wings tight against the side of the body and lose, they're basically in free fall, um, getting a little bit of lift from their body and their tail as they, uh, in the non-flapping phase. And then after, a second or so, they flap again and rise up. So they end up with this undulating flight. Woodpeckers do this to the extreme and finches also like the house finch. And um, there are certain, certain conditions, certain circumstances where that's an efficient uh, way of flying, but most of these species apparently fly at a lower speed than the calculations would suggest is the most efficient 
for that flight style. So there's still some, like almost everything about birds, still mysteries about why these birds use this, this style of flight um, when it's not, according to calculations, it's not the most efficient um, at the speed that they're flying. Um, but so many birds do it, there must be, there must be other advantages, something the equation's not taking into account, um, but still so many mysteries about birds. Um, this barn swallow um, with very streamlined, super aerodynamic, long pointed wings, long fork tail, which um, increases efficiency at, at low speed and high speed. Um, and uh, very graceful, uh, very efficient flyers. They spend most of the day flying around catching insects in the air and then migrate thousands of miles. Right now, most of the barn swallows have left the US now, they're on their way to South America and they'll spend the winter in Southern South America and then migrate back next uh, April and May. Um, turkey vultures may be the, the epitome of the efficient flyer, <laughs> the, the most flight hours with the least output of energy. And they, they rarely flap or seldom flap. And uh, um, they're able to capture lift. They have very large wings relative to the size of their body, unlike the loon. And um, they fly in this dihedral shape with their wings slightly angled up because it's more efficient um, or it, it allows them to, um, it increases stability um, so that they can, they can just sort of ride through turbulence. And by tilting from side to side, they can um, uh, counteract the turbulence without flapping. Where most birds, when they, when they get into a little bit of bumpy air, they'll have to flap a little bit to correct for it or um, keep their uh, uh, keep going straight. The turkey vultures just sort of go with the flow, tilt back and forth, let one wing get pushed up, then the other wing um, uh, produces more lift and they bounce back up. Um, so turkey vultures are incredibly efficient, um, flying for hours and hours with almost no energy output. And then maybe the most refined flying bird in the world, the peregrine falcon, the, the top speed of any known bird. Um, they've been clocked at over 240 miles per hour and theoretically could go much faster. Um, they're so streamlined and they get into this even just super streamlined torpedo shape when they're at, at top speed in a stoop. They use gravity to help them reach that speed, of course, but they're, they're, the shape of their body, the shape of their wings, and many, many adaptations of sort of microscopic feather structure, um, shape, all of that helps them reach that speed. And then they, they hit their, their target, their prey, um, at that speed and just rake their feet across. <laughs> Imagine being a a duck or a pigeon and having a, a peregrine falcon's feet um, hit you at 240 miles per hour. It's uh, uh, not going to be pleasant. But the peregrine falcon there with, with this, this incredible, um, uh, incredible streamlined shape and ability for this uh, extreme speed, when they're just traveling, um, they use a lot of the same tricks that turkey vultures do. They, uh, they fan their wings and tail to the full extent to provide the most uh, maximum lift. And like most raptors and other soaring birds, they'll use um, rising warm air called thermal. So as the sun heats up the ground, an open field or a parking lot or bare ground heats up faster than forest and that different heat um, where the ground is warmer, the warm air is rising, forms a column of warm air rising up in between the, the cooler air of the forest. And uh, birds will find and ride this rising warm air, use it like an elevator. Um, so a, a migrating or traveling peregrine falcon will, 
will glide into one of these thermals down low and then just make circles uh, to stay in the rising warm air until they reach the top as high as, high as they want to go or as high as the air will carry them. And then they've got enough altitude, they can just set their wings and glide to their next destination and look for another thermal. Um, so migrating peregrine falcons, broad-winged hawks, lots of other species um, can travel hundreds of miles and hardly need to flap just by going from thermal to thermal. Um, and another efficiency that is going to be familiar to uh, everyone is, is how birds like geese fly in a, in a V formation. Um, and it turns out that the, the, they're actually um, taking advantage of a little updraft that comes off the wingtips of the bird in front. So as a goose travels through the air, as the one on the right in this illustration is showing that the air is pushed down. They, they leave behind a downwash across most of their, their body and wing area or span. Um, they leave behind a downwash of air that was pushed down as they pass through. But off the tip of each wing, there's a swirling vortex. So there's a, a, a little bit of rising air as that air that gets pushed down by the wingtip and swirls back up around the wingtip. And the goose that's following behind can sense that and positions itself so that its wing is passing through that, um, that vortex, the, the rising part of that vortex. And they can get enough lift from that, enough added lift to significantly uh, increase the efficiency of their flight to, to require less effort for them to fly. And it just, um, I just marvel at the, the, the sense of air movement that they have to have to be able to follow the bird in front and position one wing in that vortex of rising air, the upwash from the bird in front. Um, it's just a exquisite sense of air movement, the, the, uh, to be able to feel that in their wing um, and there's, uh, uh, they, they not only position their wing in that uh, upwash, but also um, track the upward and downward um, cycle of the wings of the bird in front. So that, because that, that upwash is gonna move up and down slightly, or it follows a, an undulating path through the air as the bird in front is flapping and the bird behind will match its wing beats so that it's following the same undulating path through the air that the bird in front followed. And just amazing, the ability to sense that, the, I, I, I find it hard to, hard to comprehend um, how they're able to do that. Um, so right now we have birds migrating south. Um, all over the globe and just some incredible migrations. These, I've illustrated three species of warblers on the right. The one in particular we see here in the east right now is the black pole warbler at the top. Um, but that's, a, I've illustrated a spring plumaged male there. This time of year, they look more uh, sort of shades of olive and yellow. Um, but black pole warblers in the fall, the map on the left is showing their, their southbound migration. They take off, they, well, they nest all the way from Alaska to Newfoundland, all the way across the northern part of the continent. So some of them are coming from Alaska. They migrate across Canada to Massachusetts, Connecticut, maritime provinces of Canada. And they spend a couple of weeks in those coastal regions um, just feeding and building up fat um, as fuel. And then they take off one night and fly out over the ocean and they'll fly nonstop 72 hours from the coast of New England, the coast of Canada, across the ocean, south to um, 
Uh, some of them stop in the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, the islands there. Some go all the way to South America without stopping and burn up all the fat that they've stored um, and land in, on the north coast of South America um, uh, and find, hopefully, find plenty of food there. Um, but it's just it's one of the most incredible migrations uh, in the world, and it's happening right now with birds that are uh, probably outside all of your houses right now. If you're listening, watching this in, in New England, I bet there are black pole warblers within half a mile of you and uh, on their way south. Um, and one of the biggest, biggest questions for many decades and still largely unanswered is how birds put all this information together and find their way. Um, this is a ordinary rock pigeon, um, much maligned, but really a remarkable bird. And a lot of what we know about how birds navigate um, is based on studies of pigeons. Pigeons are the, have been, known for a long time, for thousands of years, as great navigators. Um, homing pigeons um, uh, can find their way back to their home loft from thousands of miles away. Um, and uh, pigeon racing is still popular, where pigeons are carried to some distance from their home lofts and released, and the, the ones that make it back first are the winners of the race, but the pigeons, the experiments on pigeons have shown that they, they, um, they can sense the magnetic field. They uh, use smell in some way to navigate. They use um, ex very low frequency sounds in some way to navigate. Um, and af as they learn, once they've flown a route, um, they remember landmarks. So they'll follow river valleys, they'll follow roads, um, ridges, other landmarks along the way help them to follow the route and find their way once they've seen it. Um, and we know that, um, oh, they can also, they see polarized light, which helps them to um, know the position of the sun, even when the sun isn't visible. Um, birds have a very good, um, very accurate, internal clock. So um, the way uh, sailors use a sextant and match it up to a, a very precise clock, um, birds have that clock built in as well. So the position of the sun gives them a lot of information. And they can also navigate by the stars. Um, somehow they, they understand the star pattern. And even songbirds like indigo buntings and warblers, um, when they're put in a in an experiment put in a, in a cage um, during their migration season in a planetarium where the, the artificial night sky can be rotated 90 degrees, they orient 90 degrees off according to the night sky. So it's been shown that they, they're actually reading the star pattern and, and using that somehow to navigate. But still, how they put all this together so that say the black and white warbler that nests in the woods near your house can find its way to Central America and back to your patch of woods the following spring. Um, so there's uh, lots of research ongoing, but I think there, uh, there are a couple of different potential magnetic sensing um, methods that birds use. So they can sense the magnetic field of the earth um, and they, the magnetic field of the Earth, it, it emerges from the North Magnetic Pole and, and travels over the globe and back into the Earth at the South Magnetic Pole. At each point on the Earth, there's a direction that the magnetic um, field is traveling and also an angle. It, it comes out at 90 degrees to the surface and at the equator, it's, it's parallel to the surface of the Earth, um, but it makes a big arc. So, and birds can apparently sense that angle 
as well as the direction. So the angle of the magnetic field, its slope relative to the ground, um, gives the bird some information about how far north or south it is. Um, this is my very uh, crude artist's interpretation of what a black and white warbler might see. Um, there's some thought that the magnetic sensing um, of a bird might be uh, related to its vision. Um, and so it's possible that they're actually seeing some uh, indication of uh, a magnetic compass. Um, so this is imagining if a black pole warbler was seeing the magnetic field as some vague band across the sky and a point where the slope would intersect or, or uh, um, uh, with that, uh, the arc or the, the direction of the magnetic field and also a band where the, of showing the polarized light um, across the sky. But this, birds are sensing so much more than we are. Um, and uh, we're just beginning to understand all of that. Um, but something like this magnetic sense, we talk about how important it is for migrating birds that travel long distances, but imagine a bird finding its way through a local patch of forest or something like a, a coot or a pie-billed grebe nesting in, a, in the maze of watery channels and, and reeds in a marsh. Knowing which direction is north would be incredibly helpful in the same way that, you know, as you, as you make your way through a, a big office building, um, it would be really helpful to know which way is north and south so that you could always be oriented of where you are in the building. Um, so I think the magnetic sense is probably critically or very useful in birds in their everyday uh, lives as they roam around their home territory. So this white crowned sparrow is the, a lot of these songbirds are migrating at night right now. They're, they're foraging during the day, taking off after sunset to fly south, flying all night and dropping into an unfamiliar place in the morning um, as they make their way south. And uh, it requires uh, a, a complete change in their sleep cycles, um, it requires them to find food the all day is devoted to finding food and water and feather care and uh, just maintenance, and then get up again and fly in a couple of nights. Um, it's a very rigorous and uh, difficult journey. And, um, uh, and I'll finish up with one of the, you know, so a simple thing that you can all do to make this make the birds' lives easier is to uh, make your yard bird friendly. And a big part of that is planting native plants because the native plants are host to a large community of insects um, that have co-evolved with them over millennia. So uh, an oak tree supports something like 400, over 400 species of butterflies and moths where a Norway maple that's uh, you know, obviously from, from Europe. Um, when they're planted here, there's no community of insects that has evolved with Norway maples here. And the European insects, we don't really want them to come over here as well. But a Norway maple only supports about uh, less than 10 species of um, moths. So planting an oak tree in your yard is gonna be so much better for these migrating birds that, that are landing in an unfamiliar place, just looking for a little shelter, a place to rest, um, and uh, a chance to sleep for 15 minutes and grab some food and find some water. So the more of that you can provide in your yard, the more, uh, more of these birds hopefully will be able to uh, make this whole incredible journey that they're on. And uh, I hope that this, uh, this talk today and, and my book is giving you some sense of uh, the lives that these birds lead and uh, uh, life in the treetops, life, life on the wing, um, and uh, 
it's a very different uh, experience from what we have, but uh, I hope we get some little glimpses into, into their lives and, and to what it's like to be a bird. So um, thanks. Uh, well, thank you so much, David. That was um, fascinating. And, and uh, I can't thanks. wait to, to sink into the book more. I've certainly started to look at it and, and been intrigued. And I am looking forward to more time with it. But we do have some questions. And uh, so uh, the first question I see is, um, since oil is not waterproofing for is primarily, rather the, you know, the structure is more important. Uh, what about the feathers of diving birds like anhingas and, and I guess cormorants too? How, how does this all fit with their yeah. physiology? Yeah, that's, that's a big question and um, still not, not completely answered. Um, but the, um, uh, one of the one of the possible explanations, and the one that I included in in my in the book, what it's like to be a bird for cormorants, is that they the cormorants' feathers, um, the center of each feather on their body is um, uh, uh, the 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 feathers have the barbs have barbules so they stick together and and form that waterproof structure but the margins of the feathers there are no barbules the barbs are just loose and um, move around and water can stick to them um, and stick together so the margins of the feathers get wet but the the center of the feather doesn't and the centers of all the neighboring feathers overlap so they are still waterproof but the surface does get wet and um, you know it's still it's interesting to dig into the scientific literature and find that there's still no real explanation or no agreement for why cormorants stand out of the water with their wings spread the answer seems obvious that they're they're wet and they're trying to dry off but not all cormorants do that around the world and cormorants do it in some regions and not in others um, so still, like I said before, so many unanswered questions and, and interesting um, mysteries about these birds. Um, but that's the, um, I think the, the answer for cormorants is that they, they get some, I suspect they get some benefit from their feathers being wet. And they are, um, cormorants are the most efficient marine predators known. They catch more prey per unit time than any other marine animal. Um, so they're doing something right. And uh, it's possible that by, by letting the surface of their feathers get wet, that they um, uh, it might allow them to move through the water more easily. It might make them slicker, less, less friction with the water, something like that. But nobody's really looked into that as far as I know. And, and hingas are different. Again, they have no, um, their feathers aren't waterproof. Water soaks through. Um, they get completely soaked and that's how they can submerge. So you see on hingas swimming with just their head out of the water, They're, they completely submerge. They have no buoyancy. Um, a lot of the buoyancy of a duck comes from air that's trapped by the feathers. Um, so for anhingas to swim the way they do, they have to have, water has to just, just flow through the feathers right up to their body. And that of course, obviously <laughs> limits the parts of the world where anhingas can live and forage because um, they have to stay warm. So they can only live in places where it's warm enough to allow the water to uh, soak their skin. Um, that's a, so that's a completely different and another really interesting adaptation. Um, uh, just to say, if you want to uh, ask a question, please put it in the Q&A as opposed to the chat, or I won't see it. Thank you. Um, one question is, uh, how big was the bird dinosaur the, that you found? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. It was quite small, um, smaller than a chicken. Ah. Yeah, yeah, like 12 inches long. Yeah, uh, yeah, a lot of dinosaurs were very small. And um, uh, this is, uh, so somebody asked, uh, what do you think of, of Audubon? 
I'm not sure what that, what that question quite <laughs> meant. But, uh, the society or the man and the artist? I don't know, but um, yeah, the artist. Um, you know, I um, when I was growing up, I was very focused on bird bird identification, bird illustration, and I didn't um, I didn't pay that much attention to Audubon his work. Obviously, I saw his work everywhere, but um, it didn't really connect with me. It was from a different time. And um, more recently, I've really come to sort of um, to look at it with that historical context in mind. And it's just mind boggling what he was able to accomplish. And um, so I think lots of times that the, what's behind that question is um, the fact that Audubon shot all of the birds that he painted. So every one of his paintings is based on a bird that he that he killed. And but if you think of that in, in the context of the early 1800s, there were no binoculars, there were no cameras. Um, the only reference material that he could possibly have was the bird itself. And, and there was a very different um, sort of societal thinking about killing birds and other wild animals. So everyone carried a gun and shot birds. And if you wanted a better look at a bird, you just shot it and, and got a better look. Um, that was, and he, as in his later years, he actually um, started to have some, some misgivings about all of that. But, I, but again, in order to do the paintings that he did, he had, there, there were no books about birds before his, there were no photographs, there were no, no uh, museums filled with specimens. Um, he, the only way he could do the work that he did was by, by shooting the birds. And, um, and so that, I, I give him a pass. <laughs> <laughs> on that. Um, and it's just, um, we have such a wealth of reference material nowadays and, and more all the time. It's incredible how much more there is now than there was 25 years ago when I was first working on the bird guide. Um, it was mostly before, before the internet really blossomed into what it is now, but now, uh, you know, a, a few seconds of searching on the internet and you'll have hundreds or thousands of photographs of any species you want. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah, I assume that was the, the base of the, the thinking of that, behind that question. Are you, um, are you, uh, do you feel that uh, feeding birds is, uh, with a bird feeder is, is a good thing to do, a okay thing to do? How do you feel about um, bird feeders as a yeah. way it's into the garden? Yeah, I think it's a good thing. And I, I feed birds myself um, year round. I, um, um, you know, several studies have been done and um, found that bird feeders um, have no negative or, uh, yeah, there's not no significant negative impacts of bird feeders that they, um, uh, Birds don't become reliant on the bird feeders. You're not making the birds lazy or keeping them from migrating or um, they, even when a bird feeder, so there was one study done in uh, Wisconsin, I think, at a state park where they had been feeding the birds constantly without a break for something like 25 years. So multiple generations of birds had grown up with these bird feeders and visited every single day and they, they um, marked a color marked a bunch of the birds so they could track individuals and then took the feeders down. So the feeders disappeared for a month or two in the middle of winter and the birds did fine. They, mm -hmm. they, um, uh, they said that the only, there was some ice storm event that um, uh, the birds struggled to get through and that they did better the bird feeders helped them get through real uh, bottlenecks like that. But as far as just um, the day-to-day -day of um, 
bird feeding, um, the birds are always getting the majority or more half or more of their food from the wild. Even the chickadees that are coming and going constantly from your bird feeder or the goldfinches that sit there for hours at a time just nibbling away, they're still going out into the woods and fields and finding insects and na wild native seeds and other things. Um, and uh, the bird feeder is just a supplement. Um, so I think that one of the biggest benefits of bird feeding is just the way it helps people connect with birds. Um, and there's a lot, a lot of benefits to that. Um, so here's a question in reference to the center of gravity and body mass, how do heavy build birds like storks and toucans uh, compensate for their big bills, their big noses? <laughs> yeah, well, the, the simple answer is that their bills are actually not very heavy. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're quite lightweight. Uh, toucan's bill is, um, um, it's big, but it's a, uh, it's a very sparse sort of honeycomb structure inside there. Um, so very lightweight, even though it's big. And um, some recent studies have suggested that um, that big bill is um, uh, mostly, well, it's, it's colored, so it's a big showy display thing for them, but it's, it, um, Functionally, it's useful for um, um, dissipating heat. Um, so they have some, some blood flow through their bill and, uh, and since it's not insulated by feathers, it's a way for them to uh, get rid of excess body heat. So the tropical birds with big bills like that. Um, yeah. But again, it's, it, yeah, it doesn't throw off their balance because it's not heavy. Okay, I have a couple of questions that combine, uh, you know, climate and and how to help birds. So, um, can you say something about how birds are adapting to climate change, and if there are other things that we can do besides the natives uh, planting of natives, in relation to maybe light and noise, and uh, I've, maybe on a societal level or a community level. Yeah. Well, the. Um... Um, yes, a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of ground to cover there. Um, so yeah, birds are birds are adapting to climate change when they can, um, and migrating earlier in the spring, later in fall, staying farther north in, in the winter. Some species, um, and they will. Their birds are they're so mobile and and. Uh, quick to take advantage of new opportunities. So they, they will adapt. Um, a lot of species are very limited in how much they can adapt. So the species, some coastal species that nest close to the high tide line um, will have a hard time um, adapting to rising sea levels. Um, the same way that birds that nest on mountaintops, like um, Bicknell's thrush, is a species that nests at high elevations in the White Mountains, Adirondacks, and um, in Canada, southern Canada. And as climate as the climate warms, the the um, the botany of the, the the plants that are growing on the mountainside um, shift up in elevation. So the the habitat that they use is maintained by the the extreme climate at the mountaintop and if the climate isn't so extreme then more lower elevation more southern sort of plants can grow up there and um, so they'll just get squeezed out the mountains only so high and as the plants move up the mountain slope um, the habitat becomes unsuitable for Bicknell's thrush and um, so things like that are the more specialized species just won't be able to adapt. Um, and as far as, I mean, climate change is such a big sort of all encompassing threat to birds and, and definitely one of the biggest threats that we have right now. So just supporting the, it, I mean, it requires a big political solution, a sort of national political or global 
political solution. So supporting um, uh, carbon-free energy, um, uh, switching to electric cars, um, solar power, electric, um, just getting away from fossil fuels as much as you can as an individual and supporting um, policies that, that shift away from fossil fuels um, is what we'll have to do. Um, right. And in your own backyard, again, just creating the habitat, I should mention that um, make another big part of making that habitat safe is keeping cats indoors, um, um, marking windows so that birds don't fly into them. Um, and uh, well, the question, there's a question about light and noise. Um, that's an interesting, um, you know, part of the pandemic as a year and a half ago when, when the whole world shut down and everybody stayed home and there was less traffic and less noise in the cities, um, a lot of city dwellers noticed birdsong, more birdsong. And partly it was probably just that there was less traffic noise so you could hear it more, but also um, it's known that birds avoid noisy places. Um, species like morning doves with low pitched sounds, they simply can't nest near a busy highway or some other uh, source of a lot of low frequency noise because they can't communicate. They just can't, they can't be heard. Um, so uh, those very noisy places um, and uh, are, are not suitable for, for many species of birds. And um, so the less noise, the less noise, the better. And um, the same with, uh, well, lighting, I guess the, uh, there's a lot of evidence that birds, um, birds in the cities sing at night because of artificial light, or they'll sometimes even be active at night, catching insects around uh, nighttime lighting. Um, and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know, but the, um, but noise has been shown to be a real uh, uh, deterrent to a lot of species of birds. So, um, uh, but um, yeah, the, uh, I think the, the best things that, that we can do for birds right now are, are supporting um, a, the turn away from fossil fuels, uh, reducing carbon uh, and global warming and, um, uh, and um, preserving habitat is always the key that the birds, um, they need, as these spaces change with, with the climate, the birds will need new spaces to move into. Um, and so the more land we can set aside, the more habitat we can make available to them, the better. Um, well, David, I just want, there are many more questions than you, we can possibly <laughs> throw at you, but uh, could you, one last question, could you make a comment on the intelligence of birds? Ah uh, yes, <laughs> yeah, and that's something I uh, I I talk about in the book that there's so many uh, common expressions in the English language of bird brain, dodo, silly goose, all these things that sort of demean the the intelligence of birds, and it's really not fair. Their birds are extremely intelligent. Um, and there have been experiments with crows solving puzzles that the the crows have the um, the on that particular puzzle, the, this ability that matches a five to seven year old human, um, an understanding of that that puzzle. Um, they're uh, smarter than dogs in many ways. Um, they have uh, some birds are self aware um, pigeons, which we they they often are the brunt of the uh, the the uh, dumb bird comments but their pigeons um besides their navigation ability um pigeons have recently been trained to do all kinds of things and they can discriminate they understand the difference between a drop of water a stream of water a lake of water um, but they understand that it's all water. Um, they have been trained to distinguish um, 
different styles of painting, like impressionist from surrealist paintings. And they've been trained to read um, mammograms as well as a trained human technician. They can spot the anomalies in a mammogram as well as any uh, human can. They're, um, so they're, they, they have a tremendous amount of understanding. So their, their brains are small, but their brain structure, like their respiratory system, their brain structure is very different from ours and packs a lot more neurons into the same amount of area. So even though their brain's small, they have a lot of brain space and they do all kinds of things and they, they express their intelligence in ways that we often don't recognize. But when you can get to a pigeon and, and teach it certain things, you discover that there's just a tremendous amount going on there. Yeah. So yeah, they're, they're very intelligent. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, David, for a wonderful talk and for answering lots of questions. And um, I just we appreciate your 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 both your books and yourself. <laughs> so, thank you, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Okay, take care. Thanks.